Hello, welcome back to Straightforward, Levant TV's political talk show focusing strictly on the Middle East. Today we will be discussing Iraq. But where does one start in Iraq? Having a new prime minister or asking for foreign military intervention or to stem the expansion of the Islamic State as is now happening with US airstrikes and other foreign powers aiming uh, of, at Kurdish forces. Promoting inclusive governance and other state systems that are not based on sectarian identities or fighting corruption. We will address these internal Iraqi issues vis-à-vis US-UK foreign policy, which will come in the next section. Let me first welcome our guests here at the studio, political analyst Professor Kamal Majid and researcher at King's College, uh, Rafael Marcos. Thank you very much for coming. Before we start our discussion today, let's have a look at this brief report on Iraq. Iraq plunged into further political turmoil this week as the country's president, Fawad Masoum, appointed the Iraqi parliament's deputy speaker, Dr. Haider al-Abadi, as the new head of the government. In his weekly televised address, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki responded by saying the appointment was a violation of the constitution and had no value, threatening to file a legal complaint against Masoum. Maliki has said that it will take a federal court ruling for him to leave power, with fears that he could launch a coup. However, many doubt the uniformed armed forces would follow the former Prime Minister's orders. This comes as the UN said the world needed to do more for Iraqi civilians fleeing fighters from the Islamic State group, warning that a mass atrocity or genocide of Yazidi refugees in the Mount Sinjar region could still happen within days or hours. Although Britain has already airdropped humanitarian aid, British Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond added that UK would intensify its aid efforts. However, Downing Street confirmed it will be helping the supply lines of military equipment to Kurdish forces, but it was made clear that the UK will not be supplying arms directly. On the other hand, another 130 US military personnel arrived in Iraq on Tuesday on what the Pentagon described as a temporary mission to assess the scope of the humanitarian crisis. With the Islamic State seizing more territory and Maliki clinging on to his position, the question now is how far will the West be willing to intervene in Iraq? Professor Majid, Islamic State militants have seized broad areas of northern Iraq since June. What are the elements, in your, uh, in your uh, opinion, that have led to such a success? Well, I, I, I can think of uh, five uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, according to Mr. Adil Murad, who is a Kurdish leader in Jalal Talabani's parliament, he's the leader of the parliament, yes. he actually made a statement in writing uh, saying that uh, this is part of the uh, United States policy of uh, creative uh, chaos, which was planned two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so so, so that, was, that was one reason. It was all organized. Secondly, the, 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 the army officers who handed Mosul uh, to, the, to them and also to Crete, were originally Ba'athists. The plan started two years ago when these officers pleaded to Maliki saying that they are no longer with the, with the Ba'ath and they should go back to their jobs and they were given the jobs but in fact it was they were already coordinating with the Ba'athists. Mm -hmm. The third reason is that the Ba'athists themselves, it wasn't just the Islamic uh, State or Daesh uh, or ISIS who did it, the Ba'athist party uh, the uh, uh, Naqshbandis, who are as the Duris group, were, were all uh, involved and collaborating together. They still are, and they are still uh, they're saying it is our revolution, the Ba'athists are saying. Mm -hmm. The area itself is all Sunni and, 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 and Ba'athists, the areas which uh, they occupied. Mm -hmm. The Kurds, Barzani was with them because on the same minute when they, uh, and I am a Kurd, the same minute while Mosul was being occupied and the army was uh, dismembered, uh, the Barzani also, or the Kurds, occupied Kirkuk, which is very important. Mm -hmm. And I come from Kirkuk. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and also all the, all the disputed area between the Kurdish uh, uh, government in Erbil and the Baghdadi government. So the, these, these all, all played a part. The, 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 and when you, everybody knows, and the, the, the Maliki himself admitted that there isn't a real Iraqi army anyway. Mm -hmm. That is why he decided, as soon as Somali Mosul went, he decided to form an alternative army mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. people, for an, 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 
There are uh, various armies in Iraq, like uh, Jaysh al-Mahdi, uh, like al-Badr, and like uh, al-Sahwa, mm -hmm. and uh, Asaib al-Haq, and the Peshmerga, but there isn't really an, an Iraqi proper army, and even Maliki has got his own army, and of course, the, if, if there isn't a, a professional army, you don't expect them to, mm -hmm. to, to last. So all these factors played a part for the, for the success, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the lightning success of, of, the, of the Daesh uh, or yeah, ISIS. ISIS. Rafael Marcos, do you agree? Do you think there are other elements? I think fundamentally the, uh, the, Mal the Maliki government's uh, historical policy of sectarianism, if you like. I mean, the Maliki government has never squandered, has, has constantly squandered opportunities to sort of improve the cohesion and unity of, of, the, Iraqi, of the Iraqi state and the Iraqi people. Um, this, this systematic uh, marginalization of the Sunnis over the years, beginning with, or well not beginning with, but the uh, going after the vice president, um, has, has led to a marginalization of the Sunni population, which has provided a fertile breeding ground for uh, Sunni militancy within Iraq. Um, a lot of these players are remnants of the uh, U.S. Uh, invasion militants who are now suiting back up. And another factor we have to keep in mind is that the success of Sunni militancy in, in Syria, there's a direct correlation between the rise and, and growth of extremism in Syria against uh, Bashar Assad and, uh, and the strengthening of uh, Daesh in Iraq as well. Mm. Yes, I agree. I mentioned the Sunnis, and I, definitely Maliki is a, a sectarian Shiite uh, f fanatic, uh, because in America when he was asked what, how does he define himself, he said, I am a Shi'i, then item number two, I am an Iraqi. But that could be justified in a way, especially with the Kurds, with the example of the Kurds, that they do identify as Kurds first, sometimes, be it <coughs> the Kurds of Turkey or, or Iraq. Yeah, the Kurds, the Kurds are, is a nation, not a religion, or not a sect of a religion. The, the, so, so, Maliki doesn't treat himself like an Arab against the Kurds. He treats himself as a Shiite against the Sunnis. Mm -hmm. Now, this, uh, the, the Kurds uh, also have a lot of Sunnis. In fact, the majority of Kurds are Sunnis. But they don't look at their problem as, as, a, as a sectarian religious problem. But I meant they do want independence rather than being under the Iraqi umbrella. Uh, I don't think I don't think uh, they, uh, they 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 majority of the Kurds do want in, independence. Masoud Barzani wants to have his empire uh, identified uh, and recognized internationally. Uh, but I think uh, the, the recent developments also showed, and I said that uh, during the occupation of Iraq in 2003, that the Kurds getting their independence is is a dream. Uh, Jalal Talabani, the president, says so, says that, because it's surrounded by a number of uh, non-Kurdish uh, nations like Iran, Turkey, Iraq, Syria, uh, so completely surrounded, and therefore uh, they, they use the idea of uh, independence, Barzani, is, as a threat for further oil money and further land. Mm -hmm. uh, and Professor Majid, uh, thousands of Yazidis fled to Mount Sinjar to escape the ISIS militants. We've seen paramount media coverage to this event. Um, the, what is the difference between the humanitarian difficulties or sufferings of the Yazidis so as opposed to those of the Christians in Iraq? Yes. Well, uh, the Christians are not Kurds. And the Americans are on the side of Barzani Kurds. Why is that? The America, well, the, the historical, ever mm. since... But we've seen it now, we've seen a lot of affinity. I'm we will going get to, to answer that the later, question which is more important than the reason you are asking me, if you don't mind if I Go continue. Uh, the, the, Masoud Barzani is as occupied Sinjar, claiming this was among the disputed areas, mm -hmm. which is a Kurdish area, and the Americans are supporting the Kurdish. They, they rely upon the Kurds more than they rely on Maliki, because Maliki uh, is, is one of their new friends, but mm -hmm. Barzani, even his father, they became friends since 1961 mm -hmm. against Abdul Karim Qasim. So obviously they want uh, uh, ba ba Barzani succeed. And when ba and the, 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 the Yazidis are in Sinjar, mm -hmm. who are in the Kurdish area. And by the way, Sinjar is not just Kurdish because there are Turkmen there and there are, there are uh, uh, what do you call them? Arabs there. Mm -hmm. and, and most of them were Arab al Agal mm -hmm. uh, in, tribal in, in Arabs, Sinjar, yes. yeah, tribal. Mm -hmm. uh, while the Christians were in Mosul, and Mosul is 
an, an Arabic area. Uh, so so the, 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 the Americans are not all that sympathetic with the Arabs. They are far more sympathetic with the Kurds. But there was an exodus of Christians. Well, of course, the Christians, the Christians are really the sacrifice, sacrifice of the whole issue. Mm -hmm. I, 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 made a, I was talking in a, in a demonstration in front of House of Parliament by the Christians where I said that uh, the Christians, of course, co co contributed to the Iraqi civilization and culture. All my teachers were Christians. I was taught mathematics in secondary school by a Christian t teacher. They're Jibrail. also indigenous people, of course. Of, and religious, uh, of and, and also mm -hmm. they, are, they are more civilized. And the Daesh, the, these Islamic State people are a, a bunch of hooligans. First of all, they dislike Christians, and secondly, they dislike civilization. Mm -hmm. And the Christians in Mosul were highly civilized. In mm -hmm. fact, they were the leading elements of, of, of culture in Mosul. And so their, their subjugation uh, was, was a priority for Daesh. And of course, the whole thing happened so quickly, and the Christians didn't go to, to the mountains. Mm -hmm. and they, they actually went to the Kurdish areas. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 to them, to the Americans, the, it was a problem to solve for the Kurds. They want to solve the Kurdish problem because they have to feed them. While Yazidis, Yazidis are, are, are being displaced from a Kurdish town, so all the propaganda was, was mm -hmm. in their favor. Mm -hmm. If I may, in the eyes of the American uh, public, I think the distinction between the Christians and the Yazidis is not really one that is uh, emphasized in the American media. It's more the perception of a persecuted minority being, uh, being, being chased by uh, the, the, the Daesh or the, I, the I, um, ISIS. And so the distinction that, the, that the, the Kurds versus the Christians or the Yazidis versus the Christians should get preference is not really one that is uh, perceptible within the U.S. Uh, U.S. policy or uh, U.S. public perception. However, the Kurds, there is uh, long-standing relations. And I think President Obama said it best where he really said that al-Maliki squandered every opportunity at, at making the situation better for the Iraqi people. Um, and, the, and the Kurds, on, on the other hand, he points them out for, for being tolerant, for being undivisive, for being, uh, maintaining a cohesive society with loyal security forces, and in a way, the support to the Kurds now is a reward for, for taking advantage of the space that was created by the American military in the 2000s. I agree there is hardly any difference between the, the Chris, Christians and the Yazidis. In fact, both the Christians and Yazidis and Subis and Shabak and Turkmans in Talafar, which is next door Sinjar, mm. have all been badly treated by the present government have all suffered. Most of the Yazid, most of the Christians and the, and the Subis from the south have already left the country because the, 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 the government in Baghdad for the first time in the history of Iraq is a religious government. And, and, and of course Iraq being multinational, multi-religious uh, country, the, the, they wanted to impose their superiority and they were persecuting everybody. That's mm -hmm. why the Sunnis were, were isolated and now against them. And, and, and certainly they, they, they themselves were not, they were disrespectful mm -hmm. to both Yazidis yeah. and, 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 uh, and Christians. Let me but, get to, but to uh, them, Christian hasn't got a, Christians weren't asking for a state. But Barzani wants Sinjar, and the Americans are on the side of Barzani, and therefore priority was given to the Yazidis. While in fact, there are more Christians who, uh, than, than Yazidis in Iraq, and more Christians suffered mm. than Yazidis, because they were, they were asked to leave without even a woman with her, with her wedding ring, had to take it off before going. They, they treated them f fiercely and severely, even though they had been biggest contributor uh, of, to, to Iraqi culture. Let me get back to Raphael. You mentioned uh, the, the threat on, a, on an ethnic minority. Uh, obviously, everyone appreciates the Yazidis and the Kurds being threatened, especially the, the, the people on the mount without food and, and medical uh, uh, assistance. Uh, but the Christians, speaking from a long-term perspective, these are people who are indigenous to the country, 2,000-year-old um, culture there. And like Mr. Uh, Professor Majid mentioned before, they are a very important element in the educational fabric of the country. Um, they might never come back because they lost confidence the way they went out now under threat from the ISIS. We didn't see anything to try to stop the ISIS from eradicating them. So I'm talking here about the West. So uh, 
in that sense, would you be able to compare what happens in terms... The, the move with the Yazidis was very swift. It wasn't as swift with the Christians. I think within the perceptions of the governments in Europe and the United States, the Christian issue and the Yazidi issue have been um, conflated mm. together. Um, but I do think it is, it is devastating to say that we are witnessing the, the potentially the end of the Christian community in Iraq if something is not done. Mm -hmm. um, you have reports coming out in the last day or so. I mean, the, EU, the European Union is still debating whether or not to give assistance to the Christians and to the Yazidis. But you have individual nations uh, like France, like the UK, and even the Czech Republic and Australia and, and others who are pledging support for the Christian and Yazidi communities. And I think what appeals often, the German foreign minister said himself, that the, that the Christian sensibility, that a Christian minority for a Christian nation in Europe, there is a connection there and that is sort of um, evoking a response, is contributing to evoking a response from Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rafael Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi leads ISIS with a fighting force estimated at only 7,000 while the Iraqi army, even though it's sort of disintegrated, has a count of 271,000 with 800,000 on reserve. So in that sense, can we say that it was super successful with the ISIS advances taking over major parts of Iraq? I mean, I think the weakness of, uh, it's sort of the perfect storm, the weakness of the Iraqi army uh, contributed to the, to, to the, 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 the flowing of, of ISIS across the region. Um, stripping off their uniforms um, when, when, when the uh, ISIS got towards uh, areas of the country. And uh, I mean, 7,000 perhaps of a core, a core group, but there's no doubt that the, the fighters from Syria, global jihadists, as many as 2,000 from European countries, a few hundred from, from the UK, from France, from, the, from North America. Um, and I think it's hard to get an accurate, an accurate number on how many ISIS fighters there actually are. But I, I would say the number is probably higher than 7,000, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't take away from the fact that the Iraqi army is, is a sectarian army, um, which, which show that under fire, they strip off their uniforms and they run. Mm -hmm. And now we are joined by Dr. Anas Tikriti, founder and chief of the Cordoba Foundation, promoting intracultural dialogue. Welcome to Straightforward. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Dr. Tikriti, you come from a family that is known for its opposition in Iraq. What has changed between the Islamic opposition of the times of your parents and nowadays? Um, well, what can I say? Um, I, it's very unfortunate that we're, again, uh, many years on, we're still talking about how Iraq is disintegrating into uh, very dark times. Uh, I grew up and my entire life was uh, clouded by stories of how the Ba'ath regime was uh, was uh, basically uh, playing havoc with uh, the Iraqi people, with uh, the various factions that make up Iraq for, its, for the interests of the party, then descending into the interests of the family, and then the interests of the leader. Um, and um, ultimately, when uh, you know, the invasion and the occupation of Iraq happened, and when people were, despite the fact that I was clearly against the, 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 the occupation of, uh, of Iraq and the invasion, the way it happened, um, but uh, there was a glimmer of hope that maybe things would, uh, would somehow improve. But uh, unfortunately, our worst expectations came true. And now, 11 years on from the so-called liberation and democratization of Iraq, we're talking about an Iraq where even the victims of the former regime are now will, you know, yearning for those days back then. So it's, it's quite a tragic story we're talking about. And unfortunately, the, you know, where we're talking today about a faction uh, and, a, and, a, and a part of of Iraqi society, which, uh, to be honest, you know, uh, no one was talking about up until a week ago. But um, I, I think it's important that, you know, even when we, 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 we talk about uh, these issues, uh, and whilst uh, I, I was quite public in my condemnation of the uh, atrocities committed uh, by ISIS and their line of thought, which I, uh, I, I, I as a Muslim and as uh, hopefully a devout Muslim, I, I totally disavow uh, and totally uh, see that is, uh, has nothing to do with Islam, with Iraq itself, with as a society. Uh, I believe that uh, the Yazidis, the Christians, the, even the Jews of Iraq, who unfortunately had to leave uh, a few years ago, uh, they are part and parcel of the fabric of Iraqi society. Without them, Iraq mm -hmm. wouldn't look the same. And, um, and, and therefore, this adds to the tragedies being committed uh, against Iraq and, and Iraqi people. But I would warn against 
the uh, you know towing the um, the sort of uh, um, the, the media line. Uh, the media chose to speak about the Yazidis now, so all of a sudden we're making it an issue. Before that, it was uh, you know the Christians. Maybe before that, it was a certain segment of the Sunnis. Before that, it was certain. And therefore, we're just basically towing lines that are drawn for us. And I think that it's about time that we recognize that what is at stake is Iraq. And what is at stake is the Iraqi people in their entirety. Whether it be from a, a failed central government who ultimately now we're seeing, you know, the ramifications and side effects of a failure of across 11 years. Whether it be a political structure that is, is doomed to fail, regardless of whether the people at the heart of the political system want to do their best or not, uh, the, the levels of corruption being unprecedented, the level of, the, of, of disparity between Iraqis' communities, whether they be in the south, in the middle, in the center, or in the north, uh, is, is absolutely uh, incredible, and uh, it's just unworkable. Um, uh, or whether it be the infiltration of, of, of those aliens, such as uh, ISIS, or whether before them Al-Qaeda and the such, who are now threatening people who have... Uh, been living in, in Iraq for, for thousands of years, whilst these, these aliens have only been here for, for a couple of weeks yet, they seem to assume a power authority in land. It's, it's a farce, to be honest, but I think it's about time that the narrative was corrected and rectified so that we talk about Iraq, which is at stake, and the Iraqi people in their entirety, made up of Muslims, Christians, Jews, Yazidis, made up of ethnicities such as Arabs, Persians, Turks, Tur Turkmens, uh, Kurds, uh, made up of Sunnis and Shiites within the Islamic d dominion, and so on and so forth. All those make up Iraq, and without any of them, and with the undermining of any one of those factions, Iraq simply wouldn't be the same. Stay with us, Dr. Tikriti. Professor Kamal Majid would like to add something as well. Yes, uh, I, I, his explanation is uh, very good. Uh, in fact, I am looking at it, it's really a civil war now. Mm. The, the, a civil war... What happened was when the Shia, the Shia collaborated with the American government and uh, ja, Ibrahim Ja'fari himself went to America and, and, and uh, saw the uh, Pentagon and the foreign office there and, and, and came back and I like, questioned him. Uh, they, they came to power. They didn't know how to rule. They were there to revenge from the ex-government, uh, from the previous government, who uh, threw some 200,000 shares out. So, so they, uh, they came only to revenge. Their aim was only to revenge. And they did kill, and they s s sacked all the army, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the, the, the people who, la who lost because of the war are have gathering themselves with the tribes and with the Ba'athis, and now it is a civil war. And they are also, Daesh is, is being used because with Daesh there is uh, Naqshbandis, there is the Ba'ath party, there are the Sunni tribes, and they are also really revenging. They are revenging, and they are not just revenging from, from the Christians or Yazidis, they are also, they killed many uh, Turkmens in, uh, in uh, uh, Talafar. They killed many Shias in, in, in Tikrit. They threw them into the river, as, as we saw them, yeah. uh, as saw them on the television show. They are also revenging, mm. and this will end up to really disintegrate in Iraq. Mm. To talk about attack on Christians, mm. do you, we, we shouldn't forget, three years ago, mm. the, the, the Al-Qaeda occupied a, a church in Baghdad itself and killed about more than 50 people, and the police didn't come. Mm. The police only came after the Qaeda had done their murder and, and, and left. Yes. And the, the, because the police were also a sectarian police. Back, back to Dr. Tikriti. Dr. Tikriti, you are involved in campaigning <coughs> throughout Britain's Muslim community for more involvement and a better engagement with the wider British society. What do you think of the ethno religious rift in Iraq, especially under ISIS? Is it justified in, in any sort of sense? Uh, well, no. I mean, uh, again, I mean, you, you see, the problem is, and, and this is, again, where my criticism of, uh, of the media and towing the media line uh, comes, because I, I, I get a feeling that every time we have a sensational story, it's as though history starts there and then. And it's as though now we're to, when we talk about Iraq, it's all about ISIS. ISIS appeared in Iraq just merely a few months ago. 
But the catastrophe of Iraq has been going on for years and years and years. So, I mean, uh, whilst, yes, absolutely, it's something which is extremely pertinent to talk about. And I, I'm, I'm, for one, I'm, I'm extremely critical and, uh, and regard myself as a vehement opponent of, of, of that kind of ideology, that nihilistic uh, uh, ideology of Daesh and Al-Qaeda and the such. Uh, but the history did not start with them. In fact, the failures were far earlier, which allowed Al-Qaeda and ISIS to take, uh, to take uh, a footing in, in, within Iraq. So, but, but anyway, I, I, I absolutely agree with what uh, Professor uh, Kamil Majid had, had to say. And I, I would also allude to that. I mean, he mentioned several, uh, several incidents where atrocities uh, uh, took, uh, took, uh, took place. But let's not forget, I mean, uh, as we had uh, churches... Uh, blown up and Christians killed, and as we had the Yazidis treated in the absolute inhumane way that they were over the past few days, we've also seen mosques being totally violated and blown up. We've seen Sunnis also killed. I've just received actually a, a heartbreaking message from uh, a female doctor in one of the most prominent uh, hospitals in Mosul who wrote the message merely hours before she was killed. And she was protesting simply because Daesh or ISIS had enforced uh, the niqab, uh, the veil, the face veil upon women doctors. They'd uh, prevented um, uh, male doctors from treating female patients, despite the fact, for instance, that there weren't any female doctors to treat the female patients, and yes. so on and so forth. So there, there have been atrocities committed every single segment of Iraqi society. But once again, whilst it is apt and appropriate and right that we do condemn these atrocities committed by Daesh, we must regard them as um, as a side effect and as, uh, as a ramification Does that of a wider, them, wider when you, failure when you of the central side government effect, to Dr. rule Tikriti, Iraq properly. Dr. Tikriti, when you mention side effect, are you, it sounds a little bit, I, I would just like to clarify, are you justifying when you say side effect? Of course not, of course not. But, but what I ma say but is... mainstream Islamist uh, scholars, especially in the UK, do justify completely, like people like Anjum Chaudhry, for instance. Uh, uh, but, we've seen the Islamic yes, but, but jihadi I, I, flag I, I, being yes, flown in, in East London. Yes, but I think that uh, you would agree huh? with me that uh, Anjum Chaudhry represents... I'm not comparing, of course, I'm not no, comparing. No, 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 I'm what I'm clarifying. saying is Anjum Chaudhry and his like are people who, not even on the margins of the Muslim community, they're not even within the Muslim community. They, are, they don't register in terms of numbers. They are just merely a, 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 a vocal phenomenon, a verbal phenomenon, and they're people picked up on <clears throat> by the British and Western tabloids whenever it suits them. So I, I wouldn't le really take uh, uh, their opinions in, in high regard. What I would take is the main Islamic uh, councils around the world, people like Yusuf al-Qaravawi, people like Salman al-Uda, the, the real giants of of Islamic jurisprudence, who have outrightly come out and said, you know, these people do not represent. Mm. These people do not represent. They have no legitimacy. They have no credibility. The manner in which they behave is repugnant. It's absolutely un-Islamic, the way that they speak, the way that they address people, the, the, the way that they, uh, with so ease, uh, slit people's throats and shed blood and the such. But what I mean is not to reduce the veracity of this or the importance of, of the likes of ISIS or the crimes that they're committing. But what I would say is it's wrong to assume that before Daesh and before the emergence of ISIS, everything was rosy. It's wrong to assume that all the calamities that we're talking about today merely started by the appearance of ISIS. We've been talking about Iraq by the thousands and thousands of monthly deaths for 11 years now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's something that we have come back to year after year after year. Let's not forget that every single respectable independent index in the entire world has yes. placed Iraq at the very bottom of every single list, whether it be in terms of corruption, whether it be in terms of the, the environment, whether it be in the, you know, the Mercer Index, for instance, for three years running, Baghdad, Baghdad, Banan, is the worst city in the world to live in. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, is, this, these, this came way before ISIS. So mm -hmm. whilst we can address the issue of ISIS today because it's apt and it's, it's very important and people are extremely concerned and worried and rightly so, but let's not assume that by getting rid of ISIS, everything has been sorted out. We have some deeply ingrained problems. And the fact is that I recall back in 2005, 2006, being part of a discussion with uh, a gentleman who was an analyst uh, uh, from the CIA. I was on one of the prominent 
TV stations, and he was shouting from, from Washington, I was shouting from London, and both of us were, were basically arguing on whether if Abu Musab al-Zarqawi at the time, if he was eliminated, Iraq would be okay. He was arguing that once we get rid of Abu Musab, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the Iraqis would see the, end of the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I was saying, listen, he's a problem, but he is not the be-all and end-all of Iraq's problems. And once again, we're saying, we're saying the same thing. ISIS is an incredible problem, and we have to deal with it. But to think of it as a be-all yes. and end-all of Iraq's problems is, I believe, a fallacy. Dr. Tikriti, Rafael Marcos of King's College would like to add on that. Stay with us. Um, if we assume that the emergence of ISIS is a, mere, is a mere side effect, and I think it warrants our attention what is the root cause of, the, of, of sort of this exacerbation of the conflict in the, in the recent months. And I, I think from the perspective of the American government, um, the, the sectarian policies of Nouri al-Maliki are the seminal reason, the fundamental reason for where we are today. And this, I think, is evident in the, in a way, almost revulsion from, from the U.S. government and across Europe and even amongst Iran and, and other uh, players in the region. With Maliki, his, his luck has sort of run out. Uh, and this is why Abadi has been embra embraced wholeheartedly in the United States. And there's every expectation from the EU, from the United States, and even from Iran with, with some of the statements coming out, um, that Al Maliki should step aside because his over-sectarian policies have squandered, in the words of Barack Obama, squandered every opportunity to make Iraq cohesive and inclusive. I largely agree, um, but again, uh, allow me, uh, you know, to be a, a little bit of an irritation and to sort of pose a, um, a, an opposite uh, opinion to, to, to everything thrown there. <coughs> Basically, I think that uh, whilst, uh, again, I've, I've been quite vocal and quite public in my condemnation of uh, Nouri al-Maliki's policies, I think it's also important to note that the sectarian card was played far bef before al-Maliki. It was played uh, since the, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, the publicity for the war in, uh, uh, in Iraq in 2002. Since the Americans and the Brits at the time, when they were starting to mobilize mass public opinion against Iraq, they played the sectarian card. They played the card that Iraq was ruled by, as, as they put it, a minority Sunni element targeting a, a, a majority uh, Shia community, when actually everyone who knows anything about Iraq um, re recognized that the Ba'ath Party had no sect, had no religion, had no faith. We all know that uh, at the time the most vocal uh, mouthpiece of the Ba'ath regime was actually a Shi'i by the name of Ali al-Sahaf, but the information minister. We know that Tariq Aziz was, not, was neither a Sunni or a, or a Shi'i, or a Shia. He, was a, he was a Christian, and so on and so forth. This was a regime that had no sect, that had no religion, and that really belonged to no particular race or ethnicity of Iraq, and, uh, and that everyone was a target. But to play that particular card in order to mobilize and galvanize public opinion against, uh, you know, uh, worldwide for the war was the very first steps towards then cementing sectarian politics within the new political structure. Dr. Tikriti, so, just one last question. I know you are mostly active in Britain, and we did speak about extreme fundamentalism and alternative Islamic thought. Uh, just quick, a quick comment. Do you condemn the flying of the jihadi flag in East London last week, and it was over the, in the media as well. Uh, sorry, which, which flag is this? The jihadi flag. It's a jihadi flag. It's not exactly the same one that the ISIS flies, right? but it's a jihadi flag associated with Al-Qaeda, the ISIS and the likes. Where, where was it flown? Sorry, I, I don't in, know in about that. No. In Canary Wharf in East London. Well, I mean, of, I mean, of course, I think that any sane human being would would condemn such a thing. Uh, again, I don't think that these elements, they represent the Muslim community. I think that by far and large, Muslims, not only in Britain, but across Europe and also across the world, I think that, that you know, this kind of thought is absolutely alien, absolutely alien to, uh, you know, to real Islam, to real Muslims. Had, and, I, and this is my argument to, to people who suggest otherwise. I say, listen, if most Muslims, as you put it, believe that violence, and eliminating non-Muslims uh, is part and parcel of Islamic doctrine, believe you me, we'd be seeing hundreds of 9-11s committed every single week around the world, but we don't. And you know why? It's because the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of Muslims, deny and reject and renounce 
such ideology from, from what they believe to be Islam. It's a minute minority. Their acts remain to be condemnable. They are rejected by the vast majority of sane human beings, let alone of Muslims. And therefore, I don't think they represent, to be honest. Dr. Anas Tikriti, also president of the Muslim Association of Britain. Thank you very much for your thoughts today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And uh, Rafael Marcos, uh, given that al-Maliki is still commander-in-chief of Iraq's armed forces and holds many security posts, some do worry that he will uh, ally or he will partner with his uh, loyalists to stage a coup, to stay in office. Do you think this will happen? I mean, there was certainly anxiety uh, in Baghdad in the Green Zone when Maliki's uh, special forces, which are almost like his Praetorian Guard, um, his, his, his own militia, if you like, deploying throughout, mm. throughout key sites within Baghdad. And there were rumors on the streets that, uh, that a, a potentially a mili he was willing to militarily engage these special forces to, to, to remain in power after the announcement of Abadi as, uh, as prime minister was made. But in the last day or two, or even in the last 24 hours, you've seen he, the, the, he seems to have even lost the, the loyalty of, of the military commanders. Mm -hmm. um, some of the papers this morning uh, unnamed Iraqi generals and military officials distancing themselves. He also has lost the support of Assad al Haq uh, and, and another militia, the Badr militia, which he used to rely on, have both sort of um, expressed that they're not going to follow Maliki should he choose to, to mm -hmm. embark on a military coup. And I think this, this has sort of led to his, his, his growing marginalization. And it has been a trend that the old guard usually follows the new designated prime minister. This has happened in his case as well. When Saddam fell, they were more loyal to him. So chances are they are going to be more loyal to Abadi then. Well, I think uh, as of two days ago, the, the, the Dawa party had not endorsed uh, Abadi. Uh, I'm not sure if they've come out clearly endorsing Abadi yet, but I think with, with, uh, with the Iranian uh, support going to Abadi, you're going to see a majority of Shia um, rallying around uh, mm -hmm. Abadi, which is going to lead to the, to the weakening uh, of al-Maliki, which is in conjunction with total loss of fo foreign support. Mm -hmm. The British Prime Minister yet yesterday signaled the Royal Air Force uh, Chinook helicopters could be involved in the rescue operation amid fears that 30,000 refugees were trapped on Iraq's Mount Sinjar. However, the Pentagon this morning said that a rescue operation is far less likely after U.S. Special Forces found that the number of refugees on the mountain is closer to 5,000. They said that those who are on the mountain surrounded by Islamic State extremists are in far better condition than previously feared and have access to aid drops. But before we look at Obama's Iraq policy, let's have a look at another brief report. As Iraqi President Fawad Masoum nominated Haider al-Abadi as the country's Prime Minister-designate, U.S. President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden called Abadi to congratulate him and urge him to quickly form a new government of national unity. The Obama administration welcomed the nomination of new Iraqi Prime Minister while doing all it can to ease Nouri al-Maliki out the door. President Obama has also added that the United States was prepared to ramp up its military support for the battered Iraqi military if Abadi struck power-sharing deals with the country's Sunni and Kurdish minorities. However, he has repeatedly said he will not send ground combat forces back into Iraq. As the U.S. launched its airstrikes in Iraq, American magazine Atlantic published comments from former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, which seemed to criticize President Obama's foreign policies, saying great nations need organizing principles and don't do stupid stuff is not an organizing principle. However, a spokesman for Clinton later said that nothing she said was an attempt to attack him, his policies or his leadership. Britain, on the other hand, has so far resisted calls to join the US in launching airstrikes. But after much pressure, British Prime Minister David Cameron ordered the deployment of Tornado GR4 fighter jets on Tuesday. That decision has now fueled speculation on whether Britain will join the US in its campaign. Rafael Marcos, some analysts argue that part of the problem in Iraq could be that the US had tried to impose too many of its own approaches to military development on an Iraqi structure that had no internal checks and balances to make them function once US advisors were gone. Do you agree? Or to a certain extent? I mean, I think, uh, I know I said this in the previous session, but I think the sectarian policies of the Maliki government have really acted as a, as a shot, as, as a, a pulsating through the fabric of Iraqi society, which mm -hmm. have affected the, the, the nature of the army, the sectarian nature of the army. 
um, which is why there's been harassment by the army uh, of Sunnis because of the sort of Sh Shiite allegiance of elements of the army. And I think again that the, the Maliki government and, and the Iraqi state failed to seize the opportunity, seize the space that was created by the Iraqi, uh, that by the U.S. Inva the U.S. invasion and, and and rehabilitation, if you like, of of Iraq. Mm -hmm. Professor Majid. Well, <coughs> the Americans brought Maliki and Jaffari to Iraq. They weren't there. They were out. They had run away. They were. Uh, uh, and, and so they, the Americans did impose this government on, on Iraq. Uh, not only that, the Americans did encourage, especially Martin Endick, uh, encourage the sectarian division. He, they, he was the one who said before the occupation of Iraq that we will use the Shia and the Kurds to oust uh, Saddam Hussein. He, he said it in, in front of the Senate uh, interview that Iraqi society consists of Sunni, Shi'i, and Kurds. So he was always, always stressing on the fact. When the, when the, Kurd, the, the resistance against the American occupation started, uh, the American media, the American government, and everybody else was saying that this is only limited to the uh, is a Sunni triangle. Uh, so, so there was always this stress was how to divide Iraq into Sunni Shia and, and Kurds and that's not very difficult when we know very well that both Sunnis and Shi'is are sectarian. They both, all, all the religious leaders of both parties or both sides are exceptionally sectarian. They are giving every fighter a Sunni religious man, Hayat Ulama al muslimin and the Shi'i Marja'iyya, they are giving every fighter a Quran to go and kill more Muslims from the other section. And the Americans were quite happy when it was, was happening. I mean, and at the moment, at the moment, the Americans are trying to bring the Sunnis back, to bring especially the Ba'athis back. Because the, the American government is stressing that it should be an all-inclusive now we know at the moment the parliament, there are Shi'is, there are Sunnis, there are, there are Kurds. And the Sunnis who are there are all sectarian, mm. well-known sectarian. Now when, when Mr. Kerry talks about all-inclusive, he means the Ba'athists. He means the Naqshbandis. Is that based on intelligence mm. that you have? Or? Yeah, well, uh, no, he's saying it quite clearly. Mm. There is nobody else. Uh, if, if there are Sunnis in Iraqi government and parliament as well as Shi'is and there are Kurds. The only people who are not there are the Ba'athists. And the Ba'athists did meet the Saudi Arabia and uh, the Qatar uh, in Jordan and did receive weapons and it was published in the Guardian. Okay. So the, the, the sectarianism is, is, is gone to the extent that the only other thing is that if the Ba'athists come to power, uh, the, the, within uh, or have a couple of ministers within a week or two they make a coup d'etat against the Shi'is just like they did in 1968 against Abd Razak and Naif uh, and 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 his group who were also ousted on the for, of, uh, within two weeks from the 17th to the 30th and the Ba'athists if they come to power they will definitely uh, uh, control and they have got a lot of people Ba'athists who are now working with the Shias but they are actually Ba'athists. Um, two points just I mean to say that sectarianism uh, what, what was, was, was promoted by the US administration uh, I think uh, you qualified your statement I think as, as someone who's, who has lived uh, Iraqi history and knows Iraqi history that sectarianism is not is not new to Iraq it's not it was not an effect of the American uh, uh, war. However, the, the debathification process and the scrutiny that did come on to Sunnis uh, after the invasion did exacerbate some of the existing sectarianism. But to say that the U.S. administration promoted sectarianism, I, I think is a... They did. I think it's a, a Why were they talking about the Sunni triangle? And, just, and, the, and the second... Why did they bring the Shia to power? When they formed the Majlis al-Hukum, the governing council, the Shi'is and Ja'fari himself insisted that the majority should be Shi'i. And out of 25 members, Bremer gave 13 members to the Shi'is alone, and the other 12 to be divided between the Kurds and the Turks uh, and the Sunni Arabs and, the, and, and Christian, everybody else. So in fact, Bremer went and Bremer was in co close contact with, with the Sistani of Najaf, if you read sure. his book. And so they have been all the time. They were thinking that they could succeed 
in using the Shia, but when the Shia were found out that they have got lots of relatives in Iran and they and they, are, they may be friendly with Iran, now they are they are trying to bring the Sunnis. All mm. inclusive government does mean nothing else but including bringing the Shia Ba'athis back because everybody else is already back. Let's stay in in uh, Obama's uh, foreign policy today. Uh, both Britain and the U.S. have said there would be no boots on the ground in Iraq, especially when it comes to Obama. Why do you think he is determined not to have forces on the ground in Iraq? Well, first of all, the American people are tired of wars. The American people had had a, a, a long war before the Iraqi war in, in Afghanistan, where they lost quite a lot of casualties, tired of the war in Iraq, and, and, uh, and, and they were about to go to Syria, uh, but the American people, even the Congress, were against them. So the, it, is, it is not so easy for Obama to actually bring, uh, put boots uh, on Iraq. Uh, that, is, that is, to say the least. Yes. And the other thing is uh, Obama uh, knows very well that the resistance and the opposition against the Iraqi occupation was so fierce mm -hmm. by the anti-government, anti-Americans, yes. anti that mm -hmm. they were forced to leave. Rafael Don't forget that they, they, they showered President Bush with shoes. A, a quick uh, comment on boots on the ground. I, mean, I think uh, the professor rightly hi highlights that the U.S. public has no appetite for... for All of them? Uh, you, well, uh, it's, uh, it's a good point. The Republican, uh, you have elements of the, the Republican Party that like John McCain and others who are saying that... Sarah Palin. The Tea Party is... And others who are, who are pr proposing that you, you hit ISIS hard, whatever means necessary. No one's given specifics. But I think that nobody in the administration is willing to put American boots on the ground. That being said, there already are 200 military advisors, which also include Marines and Special Forces, very elite units who are sort of doing the, the reconnaissance for the airstrikes, who are liaising with the Kurds, because the Kurds are getting U.S. weapons right now. Um, but there is no appetite for a prolonged uh, ground offensive. I th it's quite evident why over the last uh, 11 years of war. Mm -hmm. And three days of U.S. airstrikes did help Kurdish forces retake some territory from the Islamic State. Um, do you think a similar strike uh, back to the Christians in Mosul could have helped as well? Well, I think the Kurds are, in a way, a, a unique story because they have a loyal, unified, um, well-trained, but not well-supplied uh, military force. Um, and this is why weapons are flowing now from the West through very discreet channels. It's not really clear where they're coming from per se, but mm -hmm. there is signals from the U.S. that weapons of all different kinds will go to the Peshmerga right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's unclear who would sort of be the protectors of the Christian, the Christian community. I think ultimately, as the U.S. administration points out, that is the Iraqi army's job. That is the Iraqi yeah. army's job. And now we are joined by Mr. Akif Wan of the Kurdish National Congress. Welcome to Straightforward. Thank you. France weighed uh, on Wednesday saying uh, it will send arms to Kurdish forces in northern Iraq in response to Kurds' urgent need for support against the terrorists of the Islamic State. Do you think this is a positive step on behalf of France? Yes, it is, uh, because uh, the ISIS uh, are fighting against Kurds as we speak, yes, it is Christians, etc., but it is also a danger for everyone uh, as human beings. Uh, of course, that's a very important uh, positive step uh, from uh, France. I hope uh, the other countries will follow uh, humanitarian aid, uh, what they need mainly, as we speak. Mm. And uh, there seems to be some sort of affinity between the U.S. and the Kurds, m maybe not very new, but we are seeing it uh, nowadays. What are the main common interests today, do you think, between the U.S. and the Kurds? As far as we are concerned, because the uh, invasion of uh, Iraq as a whole, or, uh, now you have autonomy, of course, regional government, that area, everything has been uh, collaborated together with USA and European countries. Now they need to support continuity until that area is safe. Uh, that's why uh, that one of the responsibilities the U.S. and uh, European Union countries have. We are expecting whatever needs to be done. Uh, humanitarian aid point of view, and also rescue the people who need. Uh, also, uh, Mahmoud camp was uh, under control of United Nations. Now it's uh, almost empty. Uh, the people who have been displaced, they have to come back to that camp, and the uh, UN uh, should do their bit to contribute. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, Mr. Akif Wan, do you think now that Al Abadi is Prime Minister designate, the Kurds, do you think this would be a game changer for the Kurds and why? I, I hope so, because as far as uh, I'm concerned, Maliki has not done that bit. He is bit. If he has done uh, that bit, and now we would not talk about the issue. We're talking about ISIS, uh, Al Qaeda type of uh, uh, fanatics or barbaric uh, things happening uh, against humanity. That's why he has to learn that he has not done uh, his bit. Now he's paying the price. That's why hopefully the new uh, prime minister with new government, they will do better, not only, only for Kurds, uh, but also for all people uh, who live in Iraq as a whole and uh, North uh, Iraq, which means Kurdish regional government area, everywhere, uh, what we are expecting. And can we, see, can we see the Kurds now that they are sort of uh, approving of al-Abadi do you think they will take a short break of resisting the ISIS so as to pressure Maliki even more? I hope so. That's what we are expecting, but we never know. We will, time will show. Uh, if, the, if he doesn't, know, doesn't do his bit, Kurdish people are going to defend self-defense position. Whoever help or not, we will uh, resist. And uh, already freedom fighters are there uh, from uh, north, from south, from west. Everyone is doing their bit civilian. Uh, they're doing their bit. But of course, it will be appreciated uh, if uh, Al Abadi will uh, do his bit and prove he is uh, uh, against ISIS. Uh, hopefully, we will see in the near uh, future. Yes, yeah, stay with us, uh, Mr. Akif Wan. Uh, Professor Kamal Majid would like to add to that. Well, first of all, America can rely on Masoud Barzani because America has been an ally of Masoud Barzani since 1961, as I mentioned. He cannot rely, America cannot rely so easily on the Arabs who are now divided between Sunnis and Shi'is. Uh, so that, that their loyal uh, ally is Mas'ud Barzani himself. Secondly, the, uh, the, the Kurdish ruling part, the government, is actually divided. While Mas'ud Barzani is supported by America, and Mas'ud Barzani supports America, Jalal Talabani's party are very much afraid from Iranian, because if they go against Iran for any reason whatsoever, they will be encircled by uh, uh, an unfriendly, unfriendly society. So therefore, therefore the, um, America is concentrating only on Mas'ud. He came in because the American uh, airplanes came in because Erbil was about to go. All the people in Erbil actually already packed their, their luggage and have sent it out of Erbil, only waiting to run away when the Daesh came and the Americans came uh, to, to save Barzani. They didn't, for instance, yesterday mm -hmm. when Jalawla was taken by ISIS, by the Islamic State, because Jalawla was being occupied by the by Talabani group, they didn't come to their help at all. Uh, so, so that is one thing. The, yeah. the Kurds are not unified. I mentioned Adel Murad, who is talking about uh, creative uh, uh, chaos, the American policy yes. of creating chaos in the, in the country. Let's get back to Mr. Akif, Wan. Mr. Akif Wan, do you agree with what Professor Majid has just said? What, uh, what I will uh, suggest, uh, whatever reason they came in, they supported, they said, we want to welcome, whether they came for Baghdadi or someone else, doesn't matter for us. Uh, as long as we are concerned, there is chaos there. People uh, need uh, help. There are certain things Kurdish people can help to each other, but there is, uh, the, that help is limited. Uh, if we uh, receive any help from outside of Kurdish region, we are more than welcome. Can I just say something? Mr. Akif, one of the National Kurdistan Congress, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I say something about Ibadi, that everybody is celebrating that Ibadi has come? I think they are celebrating too early, because he is also from the Dawa party, he's one of the leaders of the Dawa party. He has al already praised Maliki, saying he's an important element of the, of the, the, the political system in Iraq, and they are trying to bring him uh, as, as a cabinet member. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, and al Ibadi being a Shiite, a sectarian himself, it's possible that he may, uh, he may continue with the war. And, and he, may co he, he, he is definitely not going to agree for the Ba'athists to come to power. And he may go with Iran because Iran's, uh, they are very friendly. There's mm -hmm. a huge economic ties between Iran and Iraq before, the, before Islam. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, Rafael, let's get back to the United States. Uh, Hillary Clinton, former Secretary of State, criticized uh, President Obama's uh, what she calls failure to support uh, moderate rebels in Syria, saying that this has led to the growth of Islamic extremism in the region. Uh, but Clinton again voted for Bush's invasion of Iraq. So uh, let's talk about the first part of the question, basically. Do you agree with Clinton in that sense? Well, I think she was actually uh, quite, quite hesitant to draw a direct uh, line between failure to arm moderate rebels in Syria. I think she is, as said, she was Secretary of State after all, she's aware of the, the wicked problems that are associated with uh, choosing who to arm in, 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 a, in, in, a, in essentially civil war. Um, but if, if I may just jump back, it's, you mentioned twice um, that it's somehow the policy of the, of the U.S. administration to, to like, reinstall the Baathists. To do? Uh, to reinstall the Baathists. I, I don't understand what... That is what, what is implied. Kerry is saying it has to be uh, all-inclusive. Now, okay. every Sunni sect and every tribe is already in parliament and have got cabinet members, yes, so what except the Baathists. I mean, I, I think uh, the notion of an all-inclusive government, call it naive democracy promotion if you like, but to say that, we're, that the U.S. is promoting the Baathists, I think that's, that's a misrepresentation of what's going on. I we mean, have, we have to wait and see, though. <laughs> mm. So, uh, back to uh, Professor Majid, the Royal Air Force in Britain was sent on a humanitarian mission in northern Iraq only to discover that there weren't as many people that needed help as expected, and then they backed off. Um, well, now David Cameron puts Iraq rescue operation on hold, so do you have any observations on these humanitarian well, missions? Well, th all this was concentrated on the Yazidis. Uh, the, 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 the problem in Iraq is not just Yazidis, it's everybody, but especially Christians. Mm. We are talking about half a million uh, Christians who have left Mosul. And they are not getting anything. Nobody is even talk, talking about, the, about them, whether they are in the mountains or in the cities. They are talking about Yazidis because their support goes for the Kurds. When they realize, that, by but the France, way... France did offer asylum for the Christians yeah, to protect yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, well, but who, brings, who takes them from half a million from, Bag from Mosul, from a destitute uh, 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 tent? In, in, in northern Iraq to France, where do they get the money? They lost even their wedding rings, mm -hmm. the, the Christians, mm -hmm. you see? Uh, the, so so the, they made, they made, the, they supported the Yazidis and they brought Yazidis to, 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 to be mentioned because of their support to Mas'ud Barzani mm -hmm. and not Jalal Talabani, mm -hmm. Mas'ud Barzani. Carl, you were right to point out the hesitancy of, of the British government, but I think you have seen a change in the last 48 hours primarily because of uh, the appointment of Abadi. You've seen in the EU, the UK, and the US, you've seen wholehearted support for Abadi in a forceful effort to marginalize al-Maliki. Um, and, and I think you are going to see increasing humanitarian assistance, France being the one now to all of a sudden mm. step up to the plate. And that's because, I think, of the, the, the apparent, the apparency that um, Maliki will step aside and Abadi is willing to play, if you will, play with the, with the West, to work with the West. Um, you mentioned an interesting point about from the Hillary Clinton interview about what is U.S. policy in this whole exactly. in this That's whole what I want to get to so in this whole mess. And she made an interesting statement with uh, the interview in the Atlantic with Jeffrey Goldberg talking about the U.S. Obama's administration compared to the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. Bush administration being one of an overextension of U.S. foreign policy, mm -hmm. the Obama administration being an underextension of foreign policy, or with yeah an underextension or withdrawal. Mm -hmm. She was again. She wasn't. She was very careful to be po political and to not overly criticize uh, Obama, her former boss, at the end of the day. Uh, but she is obviously posturing for a potential presidential run. And, and they are now at the Vineyard, what do you call Martha's it? Martha's Vineyard yes, in so uh, New England. He's on holiday in uh, Martha's Vineyard, that's right. They're trying to butter it up, I think, <laughs> but, now, uh, so I, I read. But this, uh, this under-extension, uh, I'm not really sure it's a fair criticism of, you, of, of Obama foreign policy. Um, he's made quite clear that it is not the U.S the job of the United States to intervene in all foreign conflicts and all foreign civil wars. When there are U.S. interests coupled with humanitarian interests, he's made quite clear he's willing to But they are intertwined engage. apparently with the political situation, like you said, which has changed in the last 48 hours. So even humanitarian assistance has been put on hold due to the political developments. Well, I think the U.S. was the only country that even before Abedi was mm. nominated True. was still giving humanitarian. Uh, in Europe, it was, it was sort of uh, stalled the, US, um, the UK had one airlift, then they said they didn't want to do another drop. They're worried about what might happen if the, the parcels would fall on people on the ground.
But I think this was in a way a, a stalling, mm -hmm. a stalling mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Professor Mayer. Can I can I say that there is no guarantee that Ibadi will go with the West? And it's not so easy because as a Sadrist will not go with the West. Asaib al Haq, which was a part of the Sadrist, will not go with the West. And, and, and there is a huge uh, pro-Iranian influence inside the uh, Iraqi uh, Shiite uh, pe people mm. because of economic reasons and sure. family reasons. And so it's so, not so easy for Abadi to go uh, to, uh, so easily to go with the West. They are hoping that they have, they, they think they have, by getting rid of uh, Maliki, they have uh, succeeded. But uh, we have to wait and see, in my opinion, if everybody goes with the West, there may be another civil war. Don't forget Sadr as Sadr fought against Maliki because he was accusing Maliki of being pro-Western. And, and, and if Ibadi goes that way, it will be the same thing and, and, and the problem will not, will not be solved. And Ibadi knows that. I think you correctly mm -hmm. highlight the role of Iran. That I think what's changed in the last 48 hours is statements from Iran, from the Revolutionary Guard, from the Supreme Leader's office through these indirect channels, through news postings and what interviews, whatever it is that Iran no longer will support Maliki. That Assad right, Maliki is finished. In fact, right. I saw this morning... And they sent congratulations to yeah, Abadi. Exactly. Not only that, in, in this, today, I saw a video from Baghdad, from Karada, where all, the, all of these leaders of the Shia, Shia sects uh, live. Yep. There's demonstrations in the street the attacking Maliki. They brought Maliki's photograph exactly. down mm -hmm. and tore, tore, tore it to pieces. So the Iraqi people are not really interested, either in Maliki or in Al-Abadi or in the Ba'athists. My last the question to, I, I want some peace. Yes, yes. my last question, uh, Rafael Marcos, in your opinion, and I do admit it's a tricky question. Um, to what I would like to ask you about President Obama avoiding to be in a position where he intervenes militarily, which he did, obviously, he did avoid military intervention against the ISIS in Iraq, where he was seen in a bit of a laissez-faire stance towards them in Syria, because we know the ISIS did operate in Syria. Or do you think it is simply he doesn't want to affect his legacy when it comes to withdrawing forces from Iraq and not having boots on the ground again there, which, which, which was the major part of his campaign in 2008? Which one do you think is more likely to be the case? Well, I think what you, uh, what you, what you highlight is the reason that the U.S. Has, cho has chosen to, well, just to step back, the U.S. has been willing to militarily engage. We did with Libya, we are doing now. Um, we did not in Syria for a host of a very region-specific, context-specific uh, factors. What, what, what's happened in Iraq is that it's the, the, the conflation of humanitarian concerns and U.S. interests. What we have in, in the uh, Yazidi, or in, in the Iraqi case that we did not have in the uh, Syrian case, is sort of a reliable military force to bolster airstrikes on the ground. We have the Peshmerga, who are considered reliable and unified and cohesive. Erbil is also a, a center of great commercial interests for the West. There's no doubt this is a factor. There's a U.S. consulate there, but there's also big uh, corporate and industrial uh, output that comes out of Erbil. Mm -hmm. So this is one, one factor. The humanitarian concerns are another factor. And, and the reliability of the Kurds on the ground is, is, is a factor that never really existed uh, in Syria with this disparate network of uh, free Syrian army and other rebel groups that never really we're able to unify in a politically or militarily sound way. Mm -hmm. But uh, my la your last say, we started with you, we will end the episode with you. Well, Please yeah. say your what you Well, what, uh, what happens in Syria, the Islamic State is occupying Raqqa and causing the same atrocities there that neither the American media nor the American government say a word about that. Mm -hmm. But they are doing it in, in, in Iraq, uh, and, and that is point one. Point two is that Edward Snowden, who must know, says that al-Baghdadi, uh, the, the leader of the Islamic State, was actually trained by Mossad, by the Israelis, for a whole year. Now, he can't be telling lies when he knows everything about the I American have to interject that, that, that we cannot take that. At, that is like a circumstantial rule. Why should nonsense. he say that? Why should he say that? That is a nonsense statement. We well, cannot. anyway, a lot of people believe that. And the fact that the Americans are not saying anything about uh, uh, Islamic State in Syria also indicates that, in fact, in fact, certain sections are saying uh, Madam Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton, has actually in her memoirs has written saying that we did create an uh, Islamic State, uh, Daesh, at least the, the army. That he, he said, are you talking I'm, about the new book 
Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at it. I still haven't re but, but read. But she's all of a it. presidential candidate. Would she really do so? Yeah, but he says we gave up and we discovered she was a good. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when the uh, Daesh or Al Nusra was fighting Bashar al Assad, the American government and Hillary Clinton herself personally was against every, uh, Bashar with, and, uh, with everybody in Syria who was fighting Bashar, including the Islams. The Muslim people. There's a context specific to Syria and a context specific to Iraq. And the U.S. willingness to engage in Iraq, there's things on the ground that are, that are present in Iraq that are not present in Syria. There are um, many reasons I can give you why they are interested but in differently in Syria than in Iraq. It'd be interesting to know them, but we might have to wrap up at this point. And okay, at, as this episode comes to an end, let me thank our guests here at the studio. Professor Kamal Majid, also Honorary Vice President of the Stop the War Coalition and Rafael Marcus, researcher at King's College, and our guests who joined us over the phone, Dr. Anas Tikriti of the Cordoba Foundation, and Mr. Akif Wan of the uh, Kurdistan National Congress here in the UK. And before we leave you today, I will quote a line by Rami Khouri, who said, the Islamic State type rule has no more chance of giving Arabs a decent life than did the centralized police state or the corrupt sectarian state that Arabs have endured for decades. Iraq is the place now where this issue will be put to test. Stay tuned and I'll be with you again soon on Straightforward.